Good evening, young people. This is Mrs. Rains. We're going to be talking about measurement and why we measure the way we measure and some things that you need to know about measurements. So here we go. So measuring instruments, um, instruments that we use for measuring volume are as follows. We have a graduated cylinder. We could use syringes if we need to. Something called a burette. We don't use it very often in our class, but we do use it in AP chemistry. It looks like a graduated cylinder with a uh, little syringe tip on it. We have pipettes. Um, we have small plastic ones, but we also have ones that are volumetric and transfer pipettes. And then finally, a volumetric flask, which is something that we don't use very often in um, our advanced chemistry class, but we do use it in AP chemistry. So just to make you aware, um, the smaller the instrument gets, the more accurate the instrument gets. Um, so you can see as we get smaller and smaller, we get less graduations and more just marks that give you accuracy. So this is the one we use most often. We use a graduated cylinder. This is an example of a 100 milliliter graduated cylinder. Okay, units of measuring. We measure in liters or milliliters. Um, they talk about a quart equaling 946 milliliters, but we don't measure in quarts in science. We measure in liters and milliliters. Milliliters would be the small unit. Liters would be the big unit. Okay. Reading the meniscus, so when you put liquid into a graduated cylinder, because it's a cylinder, that liquid has some properties that allows it to make a curvature. Um, in this case, the curvature is concave and not convex. Concave meaning that it caves in. Uh, convex meaning that it bubbles up. So what we see is this. We see this curve right here. Okay. What you don't want to do is look at the curve from the bottom, because then you'll read wrong. You also don't want to look at the curve from the top because, again, you'll read wrong. What you want to do is you want to look at the bottom of the curve, and this would be the correct way to read it. You have to get at the level with the um, graduated cylinder sitting on the counter to read the meniscus properly. So it's always flat on the counter. You are looking at the eye level right at the bottom of the meniscus and trying to read with the proper sight. Instruments for measuring mass. We can have a triple beam balance, or we could have an electronic balance. We use electronic balances more often in this class. They're quicker, they're faster, they are more expensive, but um, a little bit more reliable in terms of what we get. Uh, triple beam balances can be hard to operate, although they're not really hard. You just slide the little beams around until it all evens out. I learned how to use one. I taught how to use one for years. We just don't have enough that are usable to transfer between the buildings. Okay, units for measuring mass. We use kilograms and grams. Um, pounds, though, are something that we're familiar with in this country, but we don't use pounds in science. We use kilograms and grams. So we're always going to go with the SI unit here, kilograms and grams, never pounds. Instruments for measuring temperature. These are the three things that we measure most often, volume, mass, and temperature in this class. So we could go high tech here with the probeware, and we have a vernier probe that actually hooks into some probeware that we have. Or we can have just a pocket thermometer right here like you see here um, that we put into things and we get an, an automatic display reading. Uh, the vernier probe needs a little bit more. We have to plug it into something, a calculator or a computer, something like that. Or we can go the old-fashioned alcohol thermometer. Those work too, and in a pinch, we use them. Okay, units for measuring temperature. We have three units that we can ha find temperature in. In our country, we measure temperature in Fahrenheit almost exclusively. But in science, we measure temperature in Celsius, and we have another temperature scale that will be introduced if we get to gas laws called Kelvin. Um, the Kelvin scale has no zero or no negative numbers. There are no negative temperatures on the Kelvin scale. And so that's the beauty of the Kelvin scale because it predicts that there will be no negative volumes. Okay, so Celsius is our usual, but Kelvin could also be used. Fahrenheit we use in everyday life, but we do not use it in science at all. So your number should always be in Celsius. So accuracy versus precision, very simply. So accuracy and precision can be think to, thought about as a bullseye. So here we have a bullseye. We th shoot three darts at the bullseye. And what we get is poor accuracy because we didn't hit the bullseye, but good precision because all of our darts went to the same location. So we can have another one here, and we have darts going in. Uh-oh, what just happened here? 
Okay, this one has poor accuracy and poor precision. Nothing hit the bullseye and nothing was together at all. So both poor accuracy and poor precision. And finally, boom, boom, boom. This is a dart shark right here, a guy who can hit the bullseye all the time. So this is both good accuracy and good precision. So why are these important? Um, because we want to make sure that we're measuring properly. So when we have random errors that happen, that reduces the precision, that reduces the, the ability for us to repeat um, the measurement over and over again and get the same measurement. Um, systematic errors reduce accuracy. That, that's going to reduce how accurately we can measure. So random errors are controlled by the person and the way the person uses instruments. And systemic errors are actually controlled by the instrument. So if in, an instrument's not reading right, we can correct for that by calibrating it. But if a person's not reading the instrument right because they don't know how to read the instrument right, that's considered a random error and that's an issue with the person and it's going to affect how precisely you can measure things, not the accuracy that you can measure things with. So precision, it's about reproducibility. It's about checking and repeating measurements and poor precision results from poor techniques. So that's a, a person issue. Accuracy is about correctness. How correct is it to the actual value? Um, we check that using a different method. Poor accuracy usually results from a flaw in the procedure that you followed or a problem with the instrument that you have. Um, usually it's a procedure that you follow. Um, most of our instruments have been calibrated in some way, shape, or form or we calibrate them before we use them. Types of errors, system, systematic errors. Like, for example, we didn't zero the instrument properly, so it didn't read the mass properly. Or we made um, a chemical with the wrong concentration and we used that instead of using the right concentration. Random errors, so systematic errors are errors that we can't individually control um, necessarily that the instrument is creating those, those errors, it, but we can correct them in some ways. Random errors are things like the temperature in the room varies wildly. We can't control that. We can't control that one place is hot, one place is cold. Um, the person is not properly trained, so we always try to train you before you go into the lab. Okay, errors in a single direction, that means really high or really low are usually systematic errors. Errors that can happen in any direction, any direction, um, that can't necessarily be created, that can only be counted for by statistics, no big deal there. So this is where we've been talking about um, yet today in class. We were talking about how we measure something. So if we have this nail here, we can clearly see that we have centimeters and we have one centimeter marks here. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then we have 0.1 centimeter marks in between. This is very much like ruler C on our packet. And so what we can see is that we know the nail is more than six centimeters long. But how much more than six centimeters? We have to be looking right here. So we know it's three, and I it looks like the tip is going slightly over the three mark. So we're going to use significant figures, which we're going to be talking about a little bit more this week too. We're going to report what we know is certain. That means the numbers that we can actually read from the lines are certain. So we know that the six is certain. We know that the three is certain. Those are certain. The next number, however, is not so certain. And we always add the next digit for uncertainty. And every scientist does this. So we go all the certain ones, all the ones that have marks are certain. And then any one, the next one after the last one that has a mark is the uncertain mark. And we stop there. We don't go any further. So this instrument can re be read to the nearest point zero one centimeters. And that's really important to know. So if we see this, we see it's 6.35, so it's been magnified a little bit right here, and we see it's past 6.3, and they're estimating that it's about halfway, so it would be 6.35, and that would be the correct measurement. Six is definitely true. We see the sixth mark. We see the third mark. 6.3 should be the same for everyone. This five, now this is going to vary slightly. Um, you could have a four, you could have a six, maybe even a three would work, but the six and the three, should always be the same. The five is the one that is the uncertain point. Okay, here we are back at measuring the pin. If we look at the pin, we just looked at the, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the nail, and we saw some marks on here. So if we look at the pin in view A here, 
we see that we see one centimeter mark. So we're definitely sure of the ones place. We definitely know it's past the two, but not past the three. So we're definitely going to say a two. Then we're always also sure of the tenths place. That's these little marks right here. And we're between the eighth and the ninth mark. So we would definitely, definitely say 2.8. So 2.8 would be something that we could say. So we could definitely say for A, we could say 2. We could say 0.8. Those are certain. We can measure those. The next number, however, we do not have a scale for right here. There is no more scale. There are no more marks right here. So we have to guess. To me, it looks about halfway. So I'm going to say 2.85. And that is my answer for A, right? Okay, so that's my answer for A. If I look at the next one, if I look at the next one, I see something a little different. I see a very similar thing, but this time, right here between the eighth and ninth mark, I see more marks. So this is somewhat like a caliper, what a caliper would look like. Um, we have marks within marks within marks, and we can do that if we can see them. So this is magnifying that, oh, there are marks there. So if we do that, we're definitely sure of the 2. We're definitely sure of the 8 still. Um, but now we have another mark. We see the 5. So we see that the tip of that pin is right there. So we can say 5 is certain. But remember, we will always need one past certain. So the one past certain, well, it looks to me like it's exactly on the 5. If I think it's exactly on the 5, I write the number 0 because it's exactly on. If I think it's slightly over, I write the number 1. If it's more than slightly over, I write a 2. Um, I look at that, and it's a guess. So a guess implies a range. And the more numbers you list, the smaller the range is. The smaller the range is. Okay, The more numbers that you list, the smaller the range is. So, And to be honest with you, this is how we use all our instruments. If we're looking at an alcohol thermometer, we look at this. If we're looking at a graduated cylinder, we have to look at the scale. We have to look at what it's reading. If we don't look at that, then we don't get what we need. Okay? So I'm going to stop right there for today. Um, we're going to look at a little bit more of this later.